need you. You must. Oh, Tom, please. I want you. Believe me. I've never done this, felt this with a man before. I didn't know you felt this way, honestly. I'd never... I thought you knew. I... Homosexual. Sorry, I... I thought between us was just a... a deep friendship. I thought you knew about Bruce and me. I'm sorry. A landmark year. Australia was pulling out of Vietnam. Safe sex was making sure you had the handbrake on. And whaling was a genuine career option. In 1972, you could still burn off in your backyard. Smoking was good for you. And a few drinks before driving was actually recommended. Seat belts were only for wimps. .05 was the gauge of a rifle. And Lang's pen friend in Manila was a 15-year-old called Rose. In 1972... You could walk into a bank with your motorcycle helmet on, assuming you were the kind of wuzz that wore a helmet. A suntan was the key to a healthier life, and you paid to have your house insulated with asbestos. In 1972, there was that much ozone, you couldn't give it away. 1972 was a year of change. Australians wanted something more from their television. They wanted to see men in bed with other men. They wanted to see naked breasts and women's naked breasts too. They wanted to see body shirts stretched over bodies that were made for body shirts. They didn't know it, but what they wanted to see was number 96, the story of the ordinary people who lived in an ordinary apartment block in an ordinary Sydney suburb. Or were they ordinary? Five times a week at 8.30pm, the television residents of number 96 took off their clothes to have breakfast. They took off their clothes to play tennis. They took off their clothes for any damn reason at all. Arnold Feather, Vera Collins, Aldo Godolphus, Bev Horton, Les Whitaker, Don Finlayson and Dudley Butterfield. Characters that were pivotal players in the Australian sexual revolution. For five and a half years in that golden era of Australian television, Australians fantasised in black and white. Women dreamed of a meaningful relationship with Don. A relationship that would save him from his homosexuality. And men dreamt of sweeping Bev Horton off her feet. 1972. Well, sit back, relax, and make yourself comfortable as we take a peek at the way we used to be, as we salute the television series that changed the nation. Number 96. You ever get any of them young long ears with beards and beads? Oh, don't be silly. I'll be done. What? What would they want, the long rat? Hey, lady, it won't stop. What well, is what what are you doing there, lying that? Get some clothes on at once, it's disgusting. Look, man, they're all wet, see? Like the water's working, but not the, uh, <coughs> trigger. But where are the clothes you were wearing? In there. Oh. Never mind, Lizzie, I'll fix it. Got through that, right? Well, I'll take this one in back. Look, look after things for a bit, will you? You didn't worry about that, Lizzie. You know, just moved in around here, haven't you? Yeah, I just up the street. That's nice. We might be seeing a bit more of you, then, eh? <laughs> Number 96 is the type of show that parents fought tooth and nail to stop their kids from watching. And why not? Take Vera Collins from Flat 7, for instance. In the first two and a half years, Vera Collins was bedded and bashed by eight men, including a mafia don, a warlock, and her stepfather, before finding true love with Guy, the racing car driver. And all of this whilst advising people on their love lives through tarot cards. Well, to talk about Vera Collins, would you please welcome her alter ego, Elaine Lee. busy girl, weren't you? Oh, indeed I was. That brought back such memories, Steve, I can't tell you. And it was so funny. I mean, that scene between Joe Hassam and Abigail was a hoot, wasn't it? It was fantastic. Now, you seem to be in bed with everyone at the time. Well, I was. <laughs> <laughs> the funny thing is, you said about 1972, did, I don't know if your audience know, but the reason that pubs 
had television in them was because of number 96. A publican told me that. He said that at 8 o'clock, the guys used to just leave the pubs. And they realised why. They'd go home to watch number 96. So pubs were, uh, uh, television screens were put in, in pubs. Extraordinary, yeah, isn't it? true. It was, was really extraordinary. I wouldn't miss it. Quid. Did you always agree with the storyline? Absolutely not. No. Most of them I did because really, see, they did... It was the first soap opera to touch on issues like cancer and all sorts of, you know, very pertinent issues. But there was one storyline that I just thought was ludicrous in the extreme. What was, what was that one? Well, it was Vera's stepfather. She was, she was living with her ex-husband at the time, or she'd remarried him. Um, Harry, his name was, played by Norman Yim. And um, her stepfather, who had raped her when she was 12 in South Africa, got on a plane flew to Australia, got Harry out by a ruse, beat him up in a lane, broke into Vera's flat, tied her to the bed, raped her, and left and got on the next plane back to South Africa. Well, it was just absurd. <laughs> so because he flew from South Africa just to rape you? Yeah, I said she must have been a hell of a girl at 12. And also, I mean, it's <laughs> very expensive to go from Johannesburg to Sydney. Let me tell you. Go, isn't it? Yeah. We've got some footage of you and your various lovers. Oh, this will God. bring back memories. Oh, Have God. a look at some of these. This, this, this is a this is a big small report. <laughs> oh, I'll tell you about that thing. Yes. Oh. So who's Come that? Come on. That, that's Norman. Yeah. Oh, oh no, that man. I've got another story about him. I've got a story about him. No, darling. Don't. Now we have some unfinished business to look at. No, 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 you're magnificent, you really are. One of my many talents. The supreme ego was. No, I don't say it. Then what? That you're in love with me. Why? Then you want to hear? Sure. If it were true, but it isn't. are a nasty, cheating, mutt young muso pretending to be asleep like that. Did you have to sign a nudity clause? Oh, yeah, there's a funny story attached to that. I had only just been in South Africa, for, uh, uh, out from South Africa for a few months. And Agent Rang said they're doing this, you know, this television series. I thought, how wonderful. So I went along, and to my real surprise I got the role because I thought they would use somebody that they knew my role was actually written for Hazel Phillips sort of um, anyway I got the role to my surprise but I had to sign a clause that we all had to sign a nudity clause and I said to my, my husband I said you know I don't feel right about this I said but well Glenda Jackson's just done it in some fantastic film I mean I didn't know what the soap bubble was going to be like and I said, I've signed it because I've seen the young girls in the show and they're never going to ask me to do a nude scene. There's Abigail, there's Robin Gurney, there's some stunning looking birds. Well, about two months into the show, because we used to get our scripts about a month in advance, up came this nude scene. That one with Harry uh, uh, pulling Ripping it, it was Velcro, thing. yeah. I said, I can't do it. I was in a catatonic state for weeks. I then went to the producers and I said, Bill, well, this was Bill Harmon, a wonderful American man, I said, Bill, I know I've signed this clause, but I have to leave the show. I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't sleep. I come out in the sweats. Anyway, he sort of reassured me, and he said, I promise you, honey, it'll be a very close set, and everyone will be very loving and very nurturing. And, and Norman Yem was trying to be uh, very solicitous to me until he discovered that he had to be stalkers, too. And then he went into a catatonic state, I tell you. Yes. That scene actually made Time magazine, that that particular scene with him so he we had velcro on the nightdress so that he had to rip it off throw me on the bed and ostensibly rape me he was my ex-husband by the way but that was absolutely no excuse um <laughs> so i was in mortal terror of the scene i really was anyway he'd no sooner not the tack you saw um pulled the velcro and i was all i leapt into six foot into the air and was on the bed and the, Trying to get the blankets over you yeah too. and the director said cut cut honey no you look too eager he said <laughs> <laughs> i couldn't wait to get on the bed but i must say i um i did nude scenes after that that was just booby scenes but i i never got used to it and i was always embarrassed and i always hated every second i remember i was i used to you would have been a baby i just don't like to watch the booby scenes i remember them quite distinctly <laughs> you know one of my favorite storylines was the panty snippers 
storyline. Yeah, there were some implausible storylines, but I thought the panty snippers storyline really took the cake. Do you remember that one? Oh, yes, I do. I do. I mean, look, we really got away with murder because the audiences loved the characters. So whatever they did, it was acceptable, well, you know, and they believed it. I, I have this distinct recollection of the, the panty snipper sneaking into the apartment. Yes. He was always he was always hiding around. They didn't know who it was. I think we've got some footage. This guy was amazing. the trip there, isn't yes, it? And yes. I love that sound. Whenever they snip the panties, there was that sort of you know, like, <laughs> great sound. Well, well, you see it now. It really is funny. But at the time, people were so caught up with it. We, as actors, took our roles very seriously, you know. We really did. But it's funny to watch. It's great to watch. Elaine yes. sticking around for the duration of the show. Come forward to the present day. Let's get the latest news headlines with Naomi Ross. Naomi, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. Oh, very well. Thanks. You're looking yes. terrific today. Thank you. Has it Thank been you. a big news day or...? Yes, it has. Yes. In fact, um, especially here in Victoria, in fact, ten Victorian policemen um, have been charged with murder over two killings. The pilot of a twin-engined aircraft dies trying to make an emergency landing in Brisbane. Victoria becomes the first state to introduce legislation to counter Mabo-style claims. The Australian leader of a New Zealand religious cult is charged with indecent assault and the six Moronis marathon relay swim across the English Channel. Actually, they made it. I got young that. Michael Moroni just, um, he got to Calais uh, Beach about an hour ago. Yeah. What, so the others left him behind? Well, no, they did this relay. Oh, it's a so relay thing. Yeah. I would look forward to seeing Is there footage of that? We don't actually have him coming in, no. No, unfortunately. It happened an hour ago, but unfortunately CNN weren't covering it. So damn, it. damn their eyes. We're going to be back after the break with Arnold Feather, Amy <laughs> Jeff Tennant. Seven, a of number 96. Stick around. Come out of there, you hussy. You come out from underneath my bed. Do you hear me? Hey? I'm warning you. I'll call the police. You 